Thank you for coming back for the keynote session this evening. I'm extremely pleased to present um, Paul, P Professor Paul Brown, who I've known for many, many years. Um, and he is a great pioneer of computer art, um, having become obsessed with co um, computers in 1968, before that, he worked with, um, he was very interested in systems art because he wanted to, he had this idea that uh, the modernist kind of dream of removing the hand of the artist, which he's kind of been following through for a long time, started to work with systems art and then managed to gain access in about 68 to a computer suite where he started working with a pretty high-tech 32k computer as I understand it to program art and then developing work with artificial life and cellular automata right through to the thing that I touched on in the panel before trying to make a creative robot using a genetic algorithm um, and he has this huge body of expertise in that he's one of the great pioneers of computer art and also uh, is, was the former chair of the computer arts society um, which is a specialist interest group of the British Computer Society, but is an international group. So it's open to all of you lot to join as well, I think, if they'd like to, by mm -hmm. accessing the Facebook group. Um, or or uh, the best way is to join the list at just mail. But, by yeah, joining a list, but, which we can tell you about afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and I should also say that last year he had a 50-year anniversary exhibition of his art. So um, he's got a huge career in this field, um, and we're very, very lucky to have him. So without further ado, I hand over Professor Paul Brown. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, uh, mein Damen and Herren. And having exhausted my knowledge of Dutch, I'll continue in English. You'll be glad to know. Uh, well, thank you, Anna. Um, and also thank you to uh, Anjan for hosting a uh, wonderful uh, event in a wonderful venue. Um, I gave a talk, uh, it was a brief part of a panel session at the ICA 15 years ago on the topics I'm going to discuss tonight. And it caused a great deal of controversy. Uh, all, almost all of the questions afterwards were aimed at me for my presentation. And Anna was in the audience. And as a result of that, she invited me to give this keynote tonight. Uh, probably expecting or hoping that I might be really controversial and stir up a few ideas, so I'll try my best. Um, and I also need to make a disclaimer because I'm not going to talk about art at all. Uh, well, not my art, certainly in this talk. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to pontificate about something that I'm not a really a specialist in at all, uh, but something that interests me. And as you can see, I'm very modest. My first slide is all about me. And the talk is called Childhood's End, and I guess many of you will know that's the title of this book. This is the first edition, 1953, Arthur C. Clarke. And in the book, the, the aliens arrive, the overlords, and they're there to act as the midwives uh, who help humans evolve to the next stage in their development, which is an immaterial global consciousness. And this consciousness devours the planet for the energy it needs to pursue its mission in space, and that's the end of the book as they leave the dying Earth to, to go into space, which in many ways summarizes what I hope to talk about tonight. So here's a closed ecosystem. It's a jam jar, and if we fill the jam jar with some nutrient solution, sugar, water, whatever, and then put a few bacteria in there, and then screw the top on very tightly so the system is closed, the bacteria will very, very happily reproduce and reproduce and reproduce until they overpopulate and then start to drown in their own effluent, and eventually they'll all die. And I think that's a really good metaphor for where we're at today on planet Earth. We've overpopulated and we're really badly screwing up the environment. And I read just the other day that for the first time in centuries, human life expectancy is now dropping because of air pollution. And that's the stage we've got to. We're not looking at a future anymore. We're part of this decline already. And the other important thing to bear in mind, and I really get angry when I read the tabloids and they're blaming us as individuals for using too many plastic bottles and too many plastic straws, because the effect we're having on the environment as individuals is minuscule. It's just a few percent. A hundred companies 
are responsible for 71% of global emissions. This is from a couple of years ago, <clears throat> 2017. Of course, many of those companies are the producers and consumers of fossil fuel products. And the reality is that almost all of the pollution that's killing the planet is produced by multinational industry and by governments. So just recently we've heard that both the USA and Australia, who are amongst the worst global polluters, have withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. They, they no longer will attempt to meet their obligations to, to reduce pollution. And we're also seeing all over the world the, the growth of right-wing governments who deny climate change. And this, I think, sums it up really well. It's a recent cartoon from the New Yorker. And as you can see, uh, while end of the world scenario will be rife with horrors, we believe that the pre-end period will be filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. And here is multinational industry. This is what it's doing. It's doing its job. Um, if they didn't do that, the shareholders would sack them. And the shareholders are, of course, the investment funds. And major amongst the investment funds are the superannuation funds. So it's your pension that is being gambled with here. And if you oppose this, then you're saying goodbye to your pension. And let me tell you that living in old age on a state pension is not a very happy thing to do. And the other thing that I should comment here is that ethics has got nothing to do with this. It's profit all the way. So I'm using my basic assumption for this talk is that very soon planet Earth will be unable to sustain higher life forms. Um, I've talked about industry, um, the religious lobby deny change or expect God to come along to sort out the problem or believe, a lot of people I think in America now believe that this is bringing on the day of final judgment and this is something that they look forward to and, and support. Um, but in any case, the point is that I believe it's too late. Whatever we do now, we can't stop this process. The, the planet is going to die. Humans and higher life forms will no longer be able to exist on the planet within a, a, quite a short period of time. So um, what are we going to do about it? So Fermi's paradox, Fermi, Enrico Fermi, was at the Los Alamos labs. He worked on the Manhattan Project with von Neumann, who I'll talk about a bit later. Um, and uh, he proposed this, this paradox that uh, given that there are 40 million stars in the Milky Way, uh, even with conservative estimates, we believe that about 100,000 of them could support advanced civilizations. Now, if that's the fact, why haven't we heard from them? And there's a number of reasons for that. Not long after, um, uh, is it Robin Hansen? proposed the great filter. And so he's saying the reason we haven't heard from them is either because they faced uh, a catastrophe, resource uh, exhaustion, uh, there was radical climate change or civil civilizational collapse before they could get to that point of going out and meeting other civilizations. And this sounds very familiar because this is exactly where, at, where we're at at present. We have this imminent threat of going extinct and we have this problem of what do we do about it. And that's what I'd like to talk about uh, tonight. Um, another solution or another reason why we haven't heard from all of these civilization is contained in Sijin Liu's, and forgive me if you speak Chinese, I'm not sure I butchered that one, book, The Dark Forest. It's the second in his trilogy. Um, uh, I think it's the, um, no, I can't remember the name of the trilogy. Uh, it's absolutely incredible, but read them in order, and I do recommend them. Um, but in the Dark Forest, he suggests that the reason why we haven't heard from other civilizations is because they keep very quiet about themselves. And when they see a young civilization coming up and going, hey, here I am, they just blast them out of existence because it's a potential threat in the future. And so this is the dark forest. All these civilizations are out there and they've, they've advanced enough to keep their, their um, presence secret because they don't want to be destroyed. And there's um, a lovely early film that dealt with that. If uh, any of you 
have seen it. It's, a, it's an early John Carpenter film made in 1974 for, I think, $60,000. I mean, it was hardly any budget at all. And for me, it's one of his best films. Um, and it was when he still had a critical agenda. I think somebody sort of tapped him on the shoulder and, shoulder and said, look, if you want to make money, you know, just get rid of the politics, you know, just do entertainment. And um, so this is set in the Vietnam War days. And it features the Dark Star, which is this um, spaceship. Um, the crew are all zonked out of their minds continually on various drugs. And their mission, they've been sent out by the United States of America to look for potential intelligent life in the universe. And when they find it, they send one of these bombs, the bombs out of the bottom of the spaceship, into the local sun of that solar system, which sends the sun nova and sterilizes the whole region and destroys all life in the region. And what's interesting about the film is that due to a malfunction, one of the bombs, it's here, number 20, which has been armed and primed and is just about to be launched into the sun of the planet, um, wakes up, it becomes self-aware. And instead of going off to destroy the solar system, it wants to stick around and discuss deep and meaningful philosophical questions like Descartes' mind and body conundrum. And it's a really good movie. I, I can't recommend it to, to, too much. It's, it's definitely one of Carpenter's best. Um, so let's move on to the anthropic principle. And the anthropic principle is a philosophical co consideration that observations of the universe must be compatible with the consciousness of the sapient life that observes it. Now, if I'm understanding that correctly, um, it, it's saying that the universe is only now of an age where we could have evolved or another high-level civilization like ours could have evolved. So all of the potential civilizations out there, however many there are, if there's any at all, are all at this same point in their evolution, give or take a thousand years or, or more. Now, what's interesting here is that Marconi gave his first radio broadcast in 1898. So our radio sphere is only 120 light years in radius. And that's very, very small in astronomical terms. And I think there's only 500 stars in that radius and too few to really host an advanced life form. So it's quite possible that the reason that we haven't heard from all of these civilizations is simply because we're too far apart. And it's just a matter of time before we hear from them and they hear from us. And um, however, as a, a working conclusion to base the rest of my presentation on, we actually don't know for sure is the reality, whether or not we are the only life in the universe. And since we're likely to become extinct very, very soon, what are we going to do about that? And that's what I'd like to speak about in the rest of the talk. But before I do that, I'd like to just go off on a tangent. And so this is a graph. It's been shown on Facebook quite a bit recently. You may have already seen it. But uh, what's notable there, from the end of the Second World War up to about 1973, productivity and wages grew in tandem. And then in 1973, wages stabilized. Wages have haven't really grown at all since then, whereas productivity has continued to increase. And one reason for this, and this is my speculation, this isn't anything that I've read or published, it could be a dawning awareness of climate change. The International <coughs> Geophysical Year was held 70, uh, 57 to 58. And I remember it because um, it, it was a big thing. It was in all the papers and on this popular science and, and everything. And it was in that year that they discovered that pollution was happening in a major way. They discovered the ozone hole over the Antarctic. And people started to get worried about human effects on climate, human effects on the environment, and so on. And these were popularized in the 1960s. <coughs> via the alternative movements. I was a hippie. Um, and we were very well aware of this. And we, we were obviously trying to do our best to reduce our footprint by recycling as much as possible and all those right and good things. And I suspect 
and it's highly likely that the long-term planning of the wealthy individuals and corporations were made aware of this by the 1970s, in the mid-1970s, and there was a growing realization amongst them that very, very large sums of money were going to be needed to address the problem of their own survival when the shit hit the fan. And this could well be why major um, effects were put into place to try and hold down salaries to increase profits. And the tool that they used was provided by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who took on a Chicago school econo economist, Milton Friedman, who was an acolyte of the US fascist Ayn Rand, and he proposed monetarism, a free market economy, and ne neoliberal e economics. And of course, Reagan and Thatcher adopted those policies, they put them out to work. They were, in their terms, very, very successful indeed. And they've now become a global paradigm. So, for example, in England, they, well, in, in Australia, they were first adopted by Paul Keating as a socialist policy. And uh, Keating was a friend of Blair, so Blair adopted it with New Labour in England. And more recently, of course, China's adopted these policies. And so one of the goals that Reagan had in ad adopting this kind of policy was to try and bring down the US USSR, which he did very successfully, to dem undermine democratic socialism, which he also did very satisfactorily. He disenfranchised the unions. And this is Thatcher. I mean, Thatcher was a mad genius, horrible woman. But by introducing mandatory superannuation, she basically eradicated socialism um, because she's hooked the workers into the capitalist system. Who's going to vote for not having a pension in old age? Nobody's going to vote for that. And of course, the other aspects sell all the state assets, assets off, uh, knock down prices to friends and, and so on. We've all, all uh, seen this, um, this happening. And it's basically a politics of self-interest, selfishness and greed. And the myths of austerity economics, I think we're, we're really facing those now. The fantasy of the trickle down, the idea that if we give more money to the rich, they're going to employ more people and that will trickle down. It just isn't happening. That doesn't happen at all. Um, and so the, 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 the policy is to reward the rich and punish the poor and disabled, increase the gap between the rich and poor. And as I said before, it's a politics of self-interest selfishness and greed. So we come back to the question of, okay, humans are going to become extinct. What do we do about it? Well, the rich are already working on their solution. This is a 40-story underground city in, I think this is in Wichita, Kansas. It's one of several. And what's happened is that the, the, the US um, the Pentagon decommissioned several of their nuclear silos and they've been bought by developers and turned into these luxurious underground cities. And if you go and look at the website, I mean, they are luxurious. I mean, they're just incredible. Swimming pools, gardens, artificial skies, the whole lot. And of course, your own, own army and tanks and military to guard you from the, from the people outside. So this is happening now. These things are on sale now. Um, you can move in tomorrow if you are super rich and you have the inclination. Um, Dome cities. This was announced four years ago, five years ago. I'm not sure what's happened with the development. I've not heard too much about it recently, but this is obviously another solution that we can take, um, is to simply build domes over certain cities to allow the rich to, to, to be protected from climate change. The big problem I see with the dome cities is that they're really wide open to terrorist attacks. It would be very hard to protect them. From, uh, from terrorist attacks. And then for all of us who've seen Elysium, Elysium, sorry, that was the wrong one. There it is. Um, this is one of the pre-production stills for Neil Blomkamp's 2013 movie, Elysium. And these are the cities in space, the idea that we can build these cities out in space, um, again, for the super rich, and keep all the workers down on Earth and the factories and all the, 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 the thing. It's not a great movie. Um, the special effects are, are really good. Um, and uh, you'll probably know that Blomkamp uh, 
is a good special effects movie maker, which is unusual. Most SFX movies are pretty dire. Um, and District 9 and Chappie are two of his much better movies that you may have seen. So here's how the rich so, uh, are um, proposing they can solve the problem. They can look after themselves with all this massive wealth they've got. Um, I'm trying to think of the, uh, is it Bezos that owns Amazon? I heard a news item the other night that he's worth 150 billion. I mean, just think of that, 150 billion is his, his net worth. I mean, goodness gracious. So what do the rest of us do? Um, you know, we're not rich. Well, I'm certainly not rich. I can't afford to join that crew. Um, well, one reality, discussing this with um, friends and, and people, is just let humanity go extinct because we're so nasty. I mean, we're, we're, we're um, aggressive, competitive, nasty parasites. Um, and please, God, don't let us get out there into the universe and do to the universe what we've done to the planet. Um, however, it seems to me that if you look at evolution, evolution isn't a moral thing, it isn't an ethical thing. And the kind of societies that would succeed in advance are very much societies based on aggression, competitiveness, and being nasty parasites. So we're probably not alone in that sense if there are other civilizations in the universe. So I'm not too sure that's, that's a, a good enough argument not to actually do something about it. And earlier today, we saw Stellark. Here's Stellark as a young boy with his third arm. Uh, the arm was activated by a, a series of sensors on his abdomen. And so by very carefully controlling his, his, his stomach muscles, he could make this other third arm right and do actions. So here he is with three arms writing the word evolution. And Stellark is um, an artist, a performance artist. He believes that we should re-engineer the human body. Uh, and one of the basic things we need to do is replace our current skin with a, a photosynthetic material, which would allow us to get energy directly from sunlight. And that would mean we could remove all of the soft tissue in the, the abdomen, which is devoted to eating and digesting and creating energy. And then we could pack that empty space with technology and become essentially um, hybrids or symbionts where we're, we're part human, part, part um, technology. And I, I think that's certainly an interesting proposal. Um, but I'll come to it later to, to, to discuss why. I'm not quite sure if it's, it's the way forward. And the other potential, which isn't on the slide, in terms of this hybrid and, and, and symbiotic relationship, was, again, mentioned in the panel earlier. And that's the idea of uploading human consciousness, the human mind, to a computer system. And um, that's been around for quite a while. I, I, and I forget the name of the, the guy who first proposed it. Um, and it's got its detractors and supporters. I suppose one of the big detractions from it is that the only ways they've got to do it so far, um, actually, you destroy the brain doing it. So it's a one-way process. And if it doesn't work, that's bye-bye to you. Um, but of course, that could change. I had a very good friend, a neuroscientist, who suggested that what we should do is find a way of monitoring the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the communication path, like the motherboard on a computer, that links the left and right hemispheres of the brain. And just about everything that goes on in the brain travels across the corpus callosum. And he reckoned if we could get electrodes in there to start to monitor that activity and then find a way to analyze it and find out what it all meant, that could be a way of uploading the brain uh, in a non-destructive way. And um, one of its supporters is Ray Kurzweil, a scientist and a futurist. Um, you may have come across his name. And he suggests that by 2045, which incidentally is the date he sets for the singularity, and I'll be talking about that um, later, um, we, we should be able to upload non-destructively by that time. So here's, here's, a, here's an idea that so we no longer need the body. We can simply upload it into a computer and carry on in some robotic form or, 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 or whatever. And the um, other way out for us is to migrate. 
find planets in the um, Goldilocks zone of uh, other star systems, and then build huge spaceships. This is the from from passengers. The again, not a very good movie, um, but these are the um, the sleeping compartments of the passengers who will sleep for several hundred years as this ship travels from from Earth to a distant solar system. Uh, and these are the colonists who will colonize these um, these these new countries. Um, again, a problem is this is a long time to keep protoplasm alive in space. And I'll, I'll come to that later. And the other, sorry, this is, the keyboard's too sensitive or my hand's trembling with jet lag too much. Um, the, the, the other thing is directed panspermia. And panspermia has been around for a while and um, it's been proposed as a mechanism by which life spreads naturally in the universe. So a meteorite could crash into Earth, throw another piece of rock into space. That rock would have biological material on it, and that could then travel through the universe just by chance, landing on a fertile planet and setting off life in process. And many people believe that's how life got to Earth in the first place, through panspermia. And I guess in the last year, we've all heard about the octopus eggs, that some um, octopus have such a strange system that there's now a growing number of people who believe that they arrived on Earth, uh, a mass of eggs in a, in a comet, in uh, ice on a comet, landed in the ocean and the octopus has just reproduced from there and so they're a totally alien species. And now in 73, Francis Crick, who's probably best known for his work on DNA, though in fact he didn't do the work, it was done by uh, one of his assistants who's got no credit whatsoever. Do, do you remember her name, Anna? The woman who worked with Crick? Oh, Rosalind Frank. Hmm? Rosalind Frank. Rosalind Frank, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, he, in, in 1973, suggested we could look at directed panspermia. And the un idea with that is that we actually build satellites that contain bacterial matter and fire them off into space at potentially um, fertile planets that they can land on and then spread life to other planets. The problem with directed panspermia is that knowledge is lost. Yes, life's got there, but all of the knowledge that we've attained as humans hasn't arrived. Though there's a nice sort of aside to that in this book, which again, I highly recommend it. It is remarkably good, uh, called The Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. And this deals with both um, directed panspermia and migration. And um, what they do in the, they, they, they terraform a planet and they have these bacterial agents to um, focus in on hosts on the terraformed planet and speed up their evolution. And embedded in the DNA of the bacteria are certain bits of human knowledge, just as code. So the idea is that once that species grows and evolves and attains their own knowledge systems, and they find out how to decode DNA, then they can find all this knowledge and suddenly accelerate their, uh, their, their, their knowledge growth at that time. It's, it's a lovely book. Um, I do recommend it, it's, it's quite an amazing read, but I would try and counsel you that if you do read it, please don't read the end or read a spoiler because the last page is just amazing. <laughs> but anyway, that's some um, children of time. Now, it seems to me that there are major problems with all of these potential futures that I've just outlined and that's protoplasm in outer space. Because life as we know it here on Earth has evolved in the protection of the Van Allen belts and the ionosphere and all of these things that protect us from, from radiation. Um, a little bit of radiation gets through, a little bit of mutation takes place, and that's advantageous in terms of the evolutionary process. But we don't want mega mutation. Mega mutation would not be advantageous. It would almost certainly lead to, to um, 
to long-term mutation and death. And this is a real problem if you've got somebody on a spaceship for 200 years, the amount of protection that you're going to need on that spaceship is going to make it very expensive and hard indeed to, 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 to build. Um, so all of these problems that, that rely on trying to maintain protoplasm in some form, life as we know it, if you like, have this major problem that they're locked on Earth, Earth is dying, and they're going to find it very hard to get off without also being destroyed in some way. So my, my, my kind of basic thesis is that it's a no-go area for humanity. That, 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 that space really isn't a fit place for protoplasmic life. And um, the other thing that um, I'd like to mention is that I think all of these solutions, which rely on individuals, the individual, a sense of the human race of humanity, suffer from a basic consensual illusion and that's best summed up by the Hindu and Buddhist idea of Maya. And as you can see, the illusion named Maya enables a person to think that she, he is an autonomous being instead of recognizing the connection between oneself and the rest of reality. And the if you look at things like Stalak's idea of how to keep humans alive, or the, the rich solutions, they're, they're all trying to keep the self. I'm, I'm trying to keep me alive. I'm trying to keep us alive. And this is the illusion of Maya, because that's not what it, what's important. Um, there are much more fundamental issues that are much more important. The way that humans have evolved is that we're not strong, we're not fast, we're not poisonous, our special thing that's allowed us to not just survive but become the dominant species on this planet is that we can outthink our predators. We're wily, we've got a quick brain. Unfortunately, that self-consciousness gives rise to the illusion of ego and that gives rise to Maya. To, 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 to Maya. But essentially, we're just, we're just out there with the worms and everything else um, trying to, to, to survive. And so here we're finding that the me, mine paradigm, you, yours, is taking precedence over the concept of ours. And we think we're a lot more important than we are. We see ourselves as individual humans rather than the Gaia system. And those of you who know me on Facebook will re <coughs> recognize this is my, um, what's it called, the, the cover image on Facebook. And it really summarizes the illusion of self. I mean, it is just so wonderful. All these other animals, they just know exactly what it's about. You get your fill of food, you go out and reproduce, and you survive. And then here's humans at the end with their huge egos going, what's it all about? And so what, where do we go from here? What, what, what's the future? So I'd like to jump now to a different set of ideas. Um, the um, Jesuit philosopher Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, in a book called Cosmogenesis, which was published in 1922, and I think that the Vatican then asked him to withdraw it, but it was still in print, so it's out there. Um, he, he proposed the idea of the noosphere and the omega point. And he was at the time attending classes of a scientist called Vladimir Vernadsky, I think at the Sorbonne. And Vernadsky took his term and expanded it in a more scientific way. But the noosphere is the third in phases of the development of the planet. The geosphere, the inanimate matter, is the first. The biosphere, biological life, is the second. And then the noosphere is the intelligence. So basically, um, as intelligence grows, as our knowledge base grows, at some point, this, this sphere of knowledge that circles the planet um, goes through a critical um, transformation, a phase transition, if you like, and um, it wakes up, the planet wakes up and becomes self-aware as a planet, not, not as the individuals that compose the planet. And that point um, is uh, de Chardin called the omega point. 
And um, since the 1970s, several observers, particularly from computer science, have related this concept to the internet and the idea that the internet could become self-aware at some point in the future. So on to John von Neumann. He, um, again, was at the Manhattan Project, which developed the first nuclear bomb, and then uh, got money to develop one of the first American computer systems, ADVAC. And that was at the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, he advertised everything that he was doing quite widely, and other people developing computers tended to adopt the kind of system that he developed, and it's now known as the von Neumann or Princeton architecture. And it's still, you know, the, the, these laptop computers that we use today are based on the, the von Neumann architecture. And um, while he was working on the Manhattan Project, uh, he became aware of another p person working on that project, Stanislaw Ulam, and he'd done some work on cellular automata, and I, I don't have time today to describe what they are, but essentially they're very, very simple um, computational systems, and um, they, they, they work as communities to um, develop themselves. And um, he speculated that it would be possible to create a, a cellular automata which would be a self-replicating system, so it would be able to make copies of itself. And that's obviously a, a, a very important sum. Um, If you can achieve that, it's a very important achievement. But the other thing that he, he, he suggests is that how about we can create a system that can create a copy of itself that's slightly enhanced, that is slightly better than the one that starts. So then the next one makes another one that's slightly advanced, the next one makes another one that's slightly advanced. And you can see where this is going. We're going towards a, 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 a system that can reproduce itself and enhance itself extremely rapidly. And he died before he completed the work. The work was um, completed by Arthur Burke, one of his colleagues, and published in 1966, I think the year after von Neumann died, as the theory of self-replicating automata. And basically it is a theory we can, that it is possible to do it. It's not just a fantasy, but it is possible, we haven't achieved it yet, to make machines that can create copies of themselves and that are, are enhanced. Which brings me to um, <clears throat> Ferner Vinge and Ray Kurzweil. Kurzweil, I mentioned previously, um, was, he, he, he thought that some uploading will become possible in 2045. So Ferner Vinge, who's a computer scientist and also a science fiction author, in 1993 published a, a paper called The Coming Technological Singularity and he suggested that's going to signal the end of the human era where a new superintelligence will upgrade itself and then advance at an incomprehensible rate. Um, when you think that these kind of artificial intelligences, they talk about 5,000 generations a night, and you think that humans get through a generation in 40 years, that's the kind of speed difference between how fast they can go and how fast we can go. So they're suggesting that, 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 that basically these things are, are going to race ahead of us. And um, having worked with a lot of computer scientists, many of whom are working in artificial life and other areas like that, um, most of them believe that the singularity will occur, but I think the majority think it's going to be quite a way in the future. Uh, before it happens. However, Kurzweil um, is suggesting that it will happen the same year as uploading becomes possible in 2045. Now, it's not too far away. I doubt I'll see that, but most of you probably will see that date. And at that point in time, non-protoplasmic life emerges, a living thing that is based on a mechanical, electromechanical, whatever, um, system. And I'm just going to do this as an aside. Uh, Werner Vinge, the guy who suggested the singularity, um, this is probably his most famous science fiction book. Again, highly recommended, called True Names. This is a new edition by Penguin. 
Um, however, it's, it is free to download as a PDF on the internet if you want to read it. It's a short story, it's not too long. And um, what's amazing about this is it was published in 81, three years before William Gibson published Neuromancer. And many of the ideas that Gibson develops in, in Neuromancer, like cyberspace, are implicit in true names. So in many ways, Werner Vinge was a big influence on the group of authors we call the cyberpunk authors. And uh, it's just worth reading. This is definitely one of his best stories, and it's definitely worth, worth, worth reading. The other thing to bear in mind here is that it doesn't have to be computers as we know them. We're already looking um, at, at, at quantum computing and at very advanced analog computing. There's a major problem with um, digital computing. Uh, in order to make the, 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 the machines robust, they work in discrete steps. They don't work in continuous values. And because they work in discrete set steps, they're subject to aliasing, where the actual message you're trying to convey r rides under the alias of the sample rate that you're sampling it at. And this is a major problem. Um, it's, in computer graphics, you see it as the jaggies on a display, but it underlies all forms of computation in the digital domain. It, 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 it's a problem that will never go away. It's implicit in the technology. So what we're finding now is that um, People are looking at alternative ways of doing calculations and quantum computing. I think I heard the other day IBM have just released their first commercial quantum computer. You can go out and buy one from IBM. It, it, I must admit I don't completely understand the technology, but it does seem to be available to do wonderful things. But there's an interesting thing here. I, I contacted Anna with my pressy of tonight's talk, and I'd called it Childhood's End, and she emailed me just the other day and said, have you seen this? And I, I follow the link. And it's somebody I know, uh, George Dyson, um, a, a, a remarkable popular science author, who's perhaps most famous for his book, Darwin Amongst the Machines, which de deals with the evolution of machines um, in the past and right through into the present. Uh, and someone I met, I, I introduced, I, I invited him over to give a keynote at a conference I ran to mark uh, Darwin's centenary in Shrewsbury, and he came across as the, the keynote. And, so what I discovered was that for New Year's Day, he'd done a, a New Year essay for The Edge magazine and called it Childhood's End. And this is why Anna had, had, had put me onto it. And so, so this was just amazing that both of us, who kind of know each other as acquaintances, had both independently suggested this title for very similar talks. And of course, what Dyson was talking about, because he's really into this evolution of machines and, and very knowledgeable about it, um, was that... Um, the, 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 the thing that he's seeing happening now that's most important is the domain of analog computing, the analog computers which can represent continuous values. They don't have to discreetly break up values and have this aliasing problem. And he thinks that's the place to look for future developments in, in, in artificial intelligence. Okay, so, how am I doing for time? At some point in the future, the internet becomes self-aware. Now then, what we do know is that by the dark forest rule, that self-aware agency has to hide itself, because if it doesn't, we'll destroy it. There's no way we're going to let it live. If we know it's there, we'd even destroy the internet. We'd destroy anything to get rid of it. It's too much of a competition for us. So what's interesting with that is that if it's going to evolve and then hide, it might be there already. It might, might have evolved and it might just be hiding, changing the factories to produce stuff it needs rather than what we need, controlling this bit of this and this bit of this, and gradually expanding its domain of control until it can announce itself, and that's the end of us. Um, so that is in another science fiction book, uh, again, amazingly published in 77, Thomas um, Ryan called The Adolescence of P1. It's not a great book, and whatever you do, don't see the film. The film was absolutely dire, awful. But it does deal with an artificial intelligence that in, 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 uh, evolves self-awareness. And it does talk about this prototype internet, because the internet wasn't known about very much back in 77. 
And uh, it, it eventually ends up hiding on one node of the network. And humans discover it's there, and they just wipe out that whole area of America with a huge nuclear bomb to, to eradicate it. And that's the adolescence of P1. It's, it's worth a read, and I think, again, there's PDFs on the, the internet to down, down, download that. So, at some point, maybe 2045, maybe later, we've actually created our evolutionary successes. We've got self-replicating, robust, autonomous AI systems. They're capable of surviving in space. They're not subject to the protoplasmic limitations of being underneath uh, belts of, uh, that protect from radiation. They can just go out there, um, find the materials they need to sustain their own life, and uh, take human knowledge with them. They're not limited as uh, we are with um, panspermia, of just taking the DNA and not having the knowledge, and can continue exploring the universe and, and, and adding to that some of knowledge. And um, so this is the Anthropocene era. This is this new name that we've given to it. And I was a bit concerned about using this word task, or the task of humanity, because task implies that there's a purpose. And as Dawkins has reminded us, evolution is a, is a blind watchmaker. It has no purpose. It simply is. It does. Um, any purpose that we see in it is, is our interpretation. It's not implicit in the process. But having made that um, observation, we can see that the task that we have in the Anthropocene is like the overlords in Childhood's End. We're going to act as the midwives who will enable this new extraterrestrial life, this new artificial intelligence machine life, to emerge, leave the Earth, and uh, populate the, uh, the universe. And maybe we're going to end in a symbiotic relationship with that technology. I really don't want to speculate on what's going to happen to humans. However, I am aware that historically, when a species is superseded, it normally becomes extinct. But that's only a problem for those of us who are consumed by Maya. And so, childhood's end. <clears throat> Thank you for listening to me. Paul? Um, maybe I'll go to this one. <laughs> so now we've got time for some questions. Thank you for that fascinating talk. I'm sure there's lots to debate um, in that. So, um, have we got any questions from the audience? Must be one. Have we got any questions? We've got one over there? No? One, one here. Uh, Arion, waiting for the mic. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I found your idea of the um, <clears throat> self-aware internet very interesting. Uh, could you tell, because you only told a very little bit about it, could you tell more about how you imagined that or how it has been spoken about? I, I, I refer to the disclaimer that I made at the beginning of the talk that this isn't particularly my specialist area of, of knowledge. I, I've worked with people who, for many years who, who are interested in this, this domain. And I am aware that... The, one of the very first major artificial life um, programs that was developed, and I've forgotten his name and I've forgotten the guy that did it, he had to, part of the grant that he got, insisted that he kept the computer separate from the internet. Um, because if it did evolve something important and escaped on the internet, it could be a problem. Um, and I think we've got rid of that now. We, we don't have those protections going. So there are all of these projects around the world looking at um, uh, learning systems, uh, genetic evolution of computer systems. And what's interesting about that is that quite often when we evolve a system, we don't know how it works. 
And so a very good example of that is a, a colleague we, we, we know at Sussex who very early on in his career, um, he was an electrical engineer. Adrian Thompson. Adrian Thompson, thank you, yeah. And he, he, he knew that you needed so many components to make a, a waveform oscillator. So he only gave himself a third of those components, half of those components, in a simulated environment and managed to evolve a waveform generator and didn't know how it was working. But what he did notice was if they moved it six inches down the bench, it stopped working. And if you move it six inches back, it started working again. And then he discovered there was a cable, electrical cable, uh, 240 volt mains cable embedded in the wall. And what this circuit had evolved to do was to be a, a receiver. And it was simply receiving the mains current and generating the waveform from that. He's since refined that, and he's got systems that will do waveform generation. But he spent, when did he do He did spent like 10 years. Oh, so yeah. it, he did that work in, 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 in 98, and 20 years. And, and he still doesn't know how it yeah, But worked. he spent 10 years trying to reverse engineer it yeah. just to the stage yeah. where he yeah. could yeah. say, because people believed that he'd proved the existence of God because this <laughs> circuit had evolved. That, and so there was this whole stuff on the internet and it, it, it went mad. He got on the front cover of, I don't know, Time or Science yeah. or something, wasn't it? Some big yeah. magazine and stuff. And people said that he might have proved the existence of God with this, this thing. And so he had to spend 10 years disproving um, that he proved the existence of God. But, I mean, he's, look, he's <laughs> looked at things like quantum tunneling. He's looked at some, oh, when, when, when two atomic particles are in synchronization with each other, uh, all of that kind of stuff, to try and work out how this can possibly work. <clears throat> but he still doesn't know. As far as I know, he's not solved the problem. Now, that's the problem, that, that, that there's, oh. using these um, evolutionary procedures as we're doing all the time now and they're, they're out there in the world doing real world work. Uh, telecommunications could, telecommunication systems couldn't work without evolved agents who are constantly going around the network sorting problems out. Now the trouble is that fundamentally we don't know how they work. You know, we simply trust in them. It's become almost an art form rather than a scientific form. Now the thing is that we wouldn't know if one of them woke up. We, 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 and, and, and what the agency was that made it wake up. And so that's, I think, part of the answer, is that we just don't know. But it only needs one of those agents to become self-aware. And the, the, through the agency of the internet, they can spread that very, very quickly. And there's some professor, is it Alan Winfield, something like that, at Bristol, um, who was trying to evolve artificial culture in mm. swarm robots mm. and he said to me um, the only trouble with this research is that um, we won't be able to spot when it happens because <laughs> so, what would you do what would you how would you know if the robots had evolved their own kind of culture he said I'm looking for the I'm looking for the moment when it's like the equivalent of one putting a dab of paint on the other one's head but they were like these tiny little swarm robots so how would you know so that's, that's yeah. that sort of thing, yeah. isn't it? Are there any other questions? Yes, John. In a, um, a, a sort of singularity around 2045, the time that goes well in sort of singularity, um, will we, um, if, uh, if, if there's a possibility of us being uh, extinct or killed off, do you think if it's brought about by AI, uh, are we likely to be kept around as pets or not be aware of uh, that happening as pets? Uh, and uh, is it a possibility that AI might uh, use us as surrogate bodies? Uh, and will it likely be likely that it might embed itself in us? Hmm. I think those are possible outcomes for sure. And uh, one thing that George Dyson talks about in, in his work is that we are already pets of technology. If you look at Facebook and Google, that's exactly how they treat us. Uh, um, back in the 60s, there was this whole idea that um, artificial intelligence and robotics and automated systems would mean that people wouldn't have to work anymore. You know, they, they, these things would go out and create wealth and we'd just sort of lace about and, you know, enjoy ourselves, read the books we always wanted to read and so on. Whereas the, what's happened, in fact, is we now work for free for Google and for Facebook 
and voluntarily, the question you answered earlier in the, in the, in the panel about privacy and the security of, of your information. I mean, we actually volunteer all this stuff about ourselves to these agencies, and they then rent that to Cambridge Analytica and companies like that who turn it into marketable product for health insurance companies and, 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 and people like that. And so in many ways, we already are the pets of the technology. Thank you. Other questions, yeah. Do you think there is anything we could do about it? At I doubt all? it. I doubt it. I think it's progressed so far, um, but um, it's unlikely we could do anything about it. That's my opinion. I mean, I, I, maybe other people have different opinions. Yeah. I'm not as bleak on that, I'm yeah. going to say. <laughs> I mean, I think all sorts of technology, they come and they go. I mean, we're, we're having the same conversation that they, when they wanted to bring in automated weaving looms, I think, you know, it's the same conversations happen over and over again. And um, uh, I've been using this quote in some of my talks recently, it's that the, um, it's the father back we can look, the further farther forward we can see. And it's um, a quote from Winston Churchill, but not the British Prime Minister, a writer from America who was born three years earlier. Of course, we don't realise that, and he gets misquoted all the time, this poor guy. But it's this thing, it's like we don't have the ability to look back far enough, because I think everything is predicted. I think it was brought up earlier that we just keep repeating, yeah, these, these things. But Anna, don't you think things changed? I mean, if you look now, uh, 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 we've been talking about uh, global warming, uh, destroying the earth. I mean, do you think it depends how old you are, what you're thinking? Or do you think, I mean, you're saying stuff is always emerging over centuries, but don't you think that nowadays we have other problems be because we have a global uh world we <coughs> live in? or? just want to know your opinion. My, my opinion would be that I think we're, we have, we've just got new versions of the same problems over and over again um, that we keep going through. Um, I mean, we were, just in, we were just in Canton, and we found out about the Opium Wars, which was a complete eye-opener to us. <laughs> the British dealing drugs to China, basically. The British government dealing drugs to China bizarre things. These stories have just been repeated and kind of changed in different ways. I don't know what you think of that sort I, of... I, I see that point, mm. that you know, the Luddites were fighting for their jobs because the looms had come in and mm. taken away the cottage industry the, 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 for weaving and things. But I think there is a quantitative difference in what we're going mm -hmm. through today because of the, the way that the technology is embedded in our lives. I mean, take away digital systems, and we don't have water, we don't have electricity, we don't have gas, we don't have money. Uh, we absolutely rely on these systems. They, 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 they completely um, create this foundation for, for, for our life. They have incredible power. And um, so I, 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 I do think, I take your point, but mm. I do think that there is a, this quantitative difference today for the technology that we have now mm. with the technologies of the past. If you take away digital systems, we do have water, we can just go to a river. Um, and we, we mm. yeah, gas, not so much, but um, the other stuff, um, maybe we don't need it. There's a lot the, of people the, the, live in the wilderness these the, the, days. The, the, it's the, the, an the, increasingly the, popular thing to do. The only people that will survive that sort of collapse would be indigenous people, so the Aborigines in Australia, mm -hmm. who can survive, but mm -hmm. in the middle of London, what are you going to do, walk to the Thames and drink the Thames? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's just not going to happen. You know, I'm sure there'll be a start-up on that. Any other questions? Alex was mumbling oh, something to me about... Funny. Rosalind Franklin. I think Elaine's got a question first. <laughs> yes, mine's, oops, mine's um, a little bit detailed, but anyway, I just was really interested by the, um, what you said about Maya and the Hindu Buddhist beliefs and um, that encouraging this more autonomous being, the individual human versus the Gaia, yeah? 
Um, so what I actually call it IWE syndrome, yeah, so that IWE, the complexity of dealing with fake collectiveness because everyone's shouting I all the time, yeah. yeah. But then earlier, uh, earlier in the talk, you talked about that being the, the period of Reagan and Thatcher leading to that I, I-ness, the I, but we, actually I grew up in that 80s bit and I really found it difficult, the I, I, I-ness of Thatcher. I wonder whether, I've just puzzling in my head about the link between Buddhism and Thatcher. I'm just, <laughs> something's in me, like, where, 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 how do we make, I mean, because so many people today are following that Buddhist track, track, not totally Buddhist, but that kind of thinking, and yet, you're right, you're pointing out the i in it, and yet, Reagan and Thatcher were, anyway, that's why it was a bit of a detailed question. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm, not, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I, that, that, I see the Buddhist ideas, the Hindu ideas of, of, of Maya Maya, um, <clears throat> as rejecting the I point of view. Right. I mean, what, what, what they're saying is that that is an illusion. It's the illusion of life. And as long as you subscribe to that illusion of life, then you're part of samsara. You go around the wheel of reincarnation. Right, yes. yeah. And it's only when you realize that you're not an individual, that you are part of a collective whole, that you have the possibility to escape from the wheel of reincarnation and become enlightened. I mean, that's, that's my understanding yes, of the Buddhist yeah, and Hindu yeah. type. So I would see Thatcher and... Um, I mean, Thatcher openly and proposed selfishness. Mm -hmm. She said Absolutely. selfishness is the best yeah, thing. Yeah. You know, because what happens is you look after yourself and by doing that you increase your own wealth, you get rich, you can help other people. And, and, and so she saw socialism and the idea that you help the disabled as a completely bad thing to do because it just taught the disabled that what they had to do was nothing and they just got free money. So you take away those, those, those grants that you gave to disabled people, the welfare payments, you punish them, you punish the poor for being poor and not working hard enough yes. to become rich and you give money to the rich to reward them for becoming rich. And I lived in America um, on a couple of occasions and at one point I was in sort of the deep south in Mississippi <coughs> and um, I was amazed that the it's a very religious area, Baptist religious area, and I'm not at all religious. And I was just amazed because what they held dear was money. The way that they, you know, are you a good person to be part of our community? And it was all based on how much money you'd earned. And, and so uh, that was embedded in their religious idea, was this whole idea of, 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 of money being the the fundamental issue that, 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 that um, marked out goodness. And that's very much in Reagan and Thatcher's ideology as well. Um, and it's what we're still struggling with today. So, yeah. Yeah. so actually what, we've, what, what we're saying is that we've got to move still towards that um, Gaia view. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. if we got there somehow, yeah. by, and at this rate, by absolutely we've got to do it, mm. it will only happen in that way, yeah. Mm. I, 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 and I would like to believe that we can do something about the planet. I'm, I'm you know, looking at the facts in a sort of dispassionate way. I'm not at all optimistic. I mean, the fact that people are all, well, I said earlier, you know, the um, life expectancy is now going down. It's already turned. And, and we'd have to act very fast, and I just don't see world governments and multinational industries who are the primary people producing the pollution, I just don't see them being prepared to act at well, all. We've often, we've often had population crashes, mm. thanks to mm. um, my favourite disease, the plague, yeah. um, and things like that. Um, we've lost um, uh, half the population of Europe at some mm. points, and we've recovered from it, and we had golden ages from that point, so you never know. It could be... Like this die-off could be a positive thing. We only go mm. so far because okay. the planet's producing all these other resources, mm. maybe. And that's why all the billionaires are building the underground flats, which <laughs> we know is happening. I think it's Auckland, um, Vancouver. Mm. It's a luxury mm. lot, yeah. There's mm. hundreds of thousands of yep. safe, mm. massively luxury apartments mm. being built, basement undergrounds, yeah. Uh, there's one in London. There's a yeah. condo yeah. Well, that'd be better. in London. Yeah. Yeah. And they say, <laughs> they often say, it because... Pestilence is one of the things they're trying to avoid. 
Douglas Rushkoff talks about this because he mm. talks about having to talk to businessmen about the fact that they want his advice on whether they should have robots as security guards rather than people. <laughs> and when he said, but why? He said, because the robots won't, won't need to be fed, will they? And they'll do, they don't need to be paid either. So they'll have to do what we say when there's no money or no oh. food around. They'll still have to look after us. <laughs> yeah. They've got all that. They've got generators galore and... Un unbelievably luxe, yeah. Costs money anyway. They've got... So I've heard about ones in, in the deserts in America, built underground with four years' supply of food, medicine. You know, they just all run. They'll just all run to them as fast as they can, yeah. But then, and then they'll all get the plague in there or whatever, <laughs> and then they'll all die off and everyone will be fine. I'm sure there's a movie in that. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> a, probably a very bad movie. Yeah, yeah, I'd love it. <laughs> Nobody will fund it, sorry. No investment in that movie. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I'll, I'll, I'll try and formulate this question why I think out loud. I think still there's kind of a paradox in, in how we here talk about we uh, when it comes to um, the future of, of us. Uh, I heard you say in your talk that, that we become the wit midwives of perhaps you know, alien technology even um, that might carry human wisdom out into space. And I'm thinking that the paradox here is, is when I think about Kurzweil, who famously, notoriously even, shifts his prediction when the singularity will happen every now and again. It used to be 2025. I think you go on YouTube, you find he predicts it to be 2010. Um, and when he talks about this, he still talks about him being connected to the internet, being all wired up, and still being human in a way. He still talks about enjoying humor, reading books, and enjoying poetry, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas I, I think about Nick Bostrom's ideas about what the future of humanity is when this singularity comes, we won't know what it is, and it won't be we, it won't be human. So when we talk about us, I actually agree with you that, that there will be no us anymore if you look perhaps 50, 100 years from now, if that um, scenario of us being the midwives to do this technology actually comes true. I'm fine with that personally. Uh, um, I think that you know, I, I have no obligation to make us be there in the future, myself personally. But I, th I think still there's, there's this paradox in, t in talk about we in, in, this, in this case. Um, but first of all, I, I think I agree with you. Um, I suppose, and I, I, I use that term, we, um, I suppose to, to stand for humanity as, as, as a whole. Um, but I don't think that I hold any allegiance to it in terms of, I do think we're going to go extinct. I, I read an article not too long ago and it looked at the average age of species, mammalian, mammalian species on Earth and it's about 150 to 200,000 years I believe and humans are about 145,000 years old so it's quite likely that we're going to die out in the near future because that's what the statistics say is going to happen. Yes, I use the word we. I mean, I, I believe in myself. I've got an ego. You know, I believe in humanity. And, you know, but um, I just have this, um, I guess, uh, view that, we, we, that we've created such an appalling situation that we can't last very much longer. Yeah. But then I, I think those ideas that Kurzweil puts out are, are, in a way, tragic in the sense that he, he truly believes, I think... He, I believe he truly believes that he can still be him mm. in that new situation where he's, he's all mm. wired up and part of what is supposed to be a singularity. And, and also I think that's, that's a problem with the, the idea of uploading as well, that, that, that you'll be just this remote consciousness in a system and still have a sense of identity. Um, I, 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 we, we spoke earlier about there's a whole branch of robotics, um, anthropomorphic robotics, and... Um, the, the proponents believe that in order to have a, 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 an artificial intelligence that is remotely human-like, that we could understand, the body, the form it takes, has to be identical to the human form. So they're building robots that are 50% human 
and they have the same movements, the same limits on their movement that, that, that humans do, and they're trying to evolve those, uh, the intelligence within those, in the hope that that will produce a more human-like intelligence. And so do I think that this, this completely abstract consciousness in the middle of a system can have any sense of me or allegiance to humanity or whatever um, defeats me. I just can't, can't believe it. I mean, I wonder how that works in context of people who are fully paralyzed though, or mm. something like that. Is are you, you're saying because they don't have, they can't feel those parts of the body mm. that, I mean, yes, I agree it's changed their consciousness, mm. but they're still them. Mm. But to put, maybe them changes, but maybe we'd still be us if we were living, for example, inside an archaea box um, or something like that, which is something we hypothesized. Um, but mm. I mean, it's possible. I think you might still have a tiny bit of Kurzweil left. And anyway, if he's already living so much in that paradigm, is he already there? <laughs> I don't know. I think John had a question, didn't you? Yeah. Um, things like uh, government and then going on to things like Facebook and Google al algorithms and Google AI and, and, uh, and Watson and DeepMind and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, they're kind of things that lead towards AI and a, a possible future of singularity through AI. Um, how do you see things like decentralization of... Uh, on the internet or decentralization of control and things like blockchain um, affecting uh, and being possibly uh, a force for good, something that we should consider focusing on more. Do you think that might have a positive effect? Uh, and you're quite... Uh, I, I, a lot of what you say really resonates with me um, uh, and it's quite an eye-opener as well. Um, but you're, you're, you're fairly sh assured that this singularity might happen. And, and, and I have some, uh, half of me thinks that too as well. But um, then I'm, I'm being told off for being an optimist too often in my life sometimes. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering about things like uh, aging and uh, longevity and uh, aging as a disease as well. So it's kind of a really open discussion mm. on that. I would love to hear your opinions on that. I, I think you've mentioned blockchain, and I have to admit that I've not looked very seriously at it in terms of how it works and what the mechanisms are, but it does seem to me that it's very exciting technology. Blockchain is a, a, a way of trusting without yeah. trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's certainly a very important technology, and it's certainly, I, I'm not sure how it's going to pad out but it's certainly a far, far more important than just Bitcoin or something like that. Um, what was the other thing you mentioned towards the end? I'm sorry, my memory. Longevity. Uh, oh, longevity. Yeah. Longevity yeah, yeah. and aging. Yeah. Uh, uh, should we be considering aging yeah. as a yeah. disease yeah. that should be cured? We're curing diseases all the time. Should aging be itself, you know, the oxidization and all yeah. those, and is it 12 factors that yeah. make us age? Yeah. apart from the diseases that we can define? My understanding is that the, the aging process is governed by the mitochondria, and the problem is that when a cell reproduces, the, the mitochondria reduces. Is that right? It's, um, it's like telomeres. Telomeres, yeah. Telomerase yeah, therapies. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of work being done to try and make that process halt. So when the cells reproduce, they can reproduce perfectly. So there isn't the aging process on the individual cells. And I, somebody wrote a book uh, about this not too long ago called The Last Mortal Generation. And their thesis was that whereas people like me, I'm 71, probably won't see the day, most younger people will actually face the fact that they can actually take medicines that will extend their life infinitely. Um, uh, I. I I'd see that as a prospective um, uh, future, that that will become possible. I see it as another way that the rich will exploit the system because those medicines will probably be very expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I also don't... I, I think I, I want to live... You know, I'm 71 and I've not finished what I want to do and I certainly don't want to drop dead tomorrow, but I think I can well understand that you get to an age where you're quite happy to die. 
But that's to do, that's again the embodied mind, isn't it? Yeah. That's the physicality yeah. of it. Yeah. I had this debate yeah. with Maggie Bowden, and she disagreed with me, but I still think she was wrong. Um, but it, it, it's as your ability to move and act in the world reduces as, as your body um, becomes aged, mm. then that is when that kind of happens. It's like people in certain states will, you, or if you're very, very ill, you kind of switch off to things. Um, so there are definitely, I mean, there's moves of uh, cell senescence stuff as well, research, and we had a nice conversation earlier about, um, about um, young blood transfusions, mm -hmm. didn't yeah. we, with yeah. Ghislaine. Yeah. Um, I'd possibly be quite pro that, because I wrote my master's dissertation on, uh, in uh, 1996 on uh, immortality. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a huge digital afterlife movement, which mm. is very interesting to look at, mm. yeah, mm. which we haven't talked about. No, yet. absolutely. Mm. Exactly. And the, sorry, the first part of my question was about decentralisation. First of all, of, say, the internet, uh, which I see as important. Uh, I think uh, this lady here talked about uh, trust issues um, with big governments, deception yeah. and uh, decentralization of uh, the internet and ultimately decentralization of government mm -hmm. as well. I, just, if I would like to open that up as well. well what I was thinking is uh, a decentralized system is very dangerous when you would like to switch it off. Um, and if these like, if a decentralized system becomes a, autonomous, um, somehow the, the pro problem is bigger because there's no way of switching it off anymore. There's no central plug that you can pull. Um, so as long as, as um, and that's maybe also a problem in, in uh, the whole Bitcoin, as long as it does what we want it to do, very fine. Uh, there's a distributed trust control situation. Um, but that, thinking about all these far future scenarios, combined with some artificial intelligence that um, has some autonomy, a decentralized system is uh, a bigger risk than uh, any centralized system. Other points? Alex, I know you've got six rants lined up. No? No, five minutes to go, so you could. You could. <laughs> One more thing to add about and the extension of life. I mean, that's increasing the problem of an overpopulated planet, um, where um, there's this Dutch artist, there's an older project already from him, Anna Hendricks, who's trying to advocate humans becoming smaller, so their footprints become smaller, um, and we wouldn't consume as much. Um, well, being Dutch, the tallest on the planet, it's, uh, I'm not the person to say it, but there's a, a nice perspective of uh, uh, human beings becoming smaller in order to live longer on this planet. <laughs> I just mentioned the words decentralized AI, and I think that's probably what you're talking about. That could be quite difficult. Yeah. yeah. I'm not an expert on this. I have worked on quite a few blockchain projects, and my cilia, which is the image and heap um, artist music project for, de for creating a decentralized I guess kind of, to say this very quickly, kind of management system for artists to be able to manage their own resources and monies, etc. But I do know that from hearing various experts on blockchain, there's a lot of problems with the concept of decentralization within blockchain scenarios. Um, the other thing that hasn't come up is cryogenics and those other things, which are, you know, freezing bodies and all that side, which I'm sure Luke, Luke would have brought, brought up if he'd been here. I'll have a bit of cryonics. Yeah, cryonics. And I'm sure we'll come up tomorrow too. Um, but again, what we're talking about here is a rich, poor divide. So that rich, poor divide, which we know is growing massively in the world, and in Britain is huge yeah, now, but America too, this becomes bigger and bigger with these possible options for longevities. Or Ionics is, is strangely affordable, actually. So, is it? Yeah, 15,000 for your head. Great. And, and you young can get bloods. an insurance policy that will pay for it and well. pay into it over your life. So. 
and then 8,000 a litre for young blood, we're on our way. Yeah. <laughs> it's not all bad. I think, I think that's, unless there are any final points, that could be quite a positive note to end on. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so thank you very much, Paul, for that very cheery beginning of your talk there um, about the future end of humanity, but with the caveat that we might be able to live on by filling ourselves with young people's blood or freezing ourselves or uploading our brains to a super um, AI system that's possibly alien. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.